uh, together with Professor Aslam on the topic of curriculum transformation and integrated Islamic University. Uh, Professor Ibrahim from Tripa IT Thailand will be moderating this session. I will pass over to Dr. Ibrahim. Most. Please, Dr. Ibrahim. Okay, thank uh, Professor Emeritus, Prof. Jamil Usman. Uh, let's come to the second session of today's program on the online regional workshop on the development of sustainable private Islamic educational institution. And yesterday we will enrich our knowledge with the management of human and financial resources and followed by direct experiences from the uh, of the establishment and management of the private university uh, presented by the rector of the Fatani University. Now let me go to the one of the most important thing in education, the curriculum, which is regarded as the heart of education uh, and regarded as a com campus uh, of education, showing the direction that we are going. Without knowing the direction, of course, we cannot go to our destination. And this session, and this session uh, will be honored by two prominent speakers and, and scholars. First, uh, uh, Dr. Wira Professor Dr. Jamil Usman, the former rector of Insania and the former deputy rector of the International Islamic University, Malaysia and the current advisor to the director for regional cooperation the international of the international institute of islamic thought uh, since uh, since times uh, given is very short i will not go to all to his uh, academic profile otherwise we will terminate our our session by mentioning his uh, very long academic uh, profile and the second prominent speaker is professor dr muhammad Aslam Muhammad Hanif, the professor in economic of the International Islamic University and the, uh, currently he is the director of academic development division of the International Institute of Islamic Thought, East and Southeast Asia. And uh, due to time uh, limited given to us, I would like to call upon Dr. Wira Professor Emeritus Dr. Jamil Osman, Tafadal, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Ibrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Rabbina alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala shabir al-anbiya. Wa al-mursalim. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Our sessions now is the, about, the, about the curriculum. It's more on academic. Uh, we, our focus will be more on the curriculum transformation from uh, traditional based uh, Islamic uh, traditional based Islamic in university to a full flesh integrated university uh, as you all know um, our focus is for private Islamic universities in the Muslim world and you know very well that most of our the private Islamic universities in the Muslim world started their the program with full Islamic studies uh, without any conventional program. In fact, uh, the oldest university uh, in the world, uh, Al Qurayyun University and uh, Al Azhar University. Azhar, which was founded in 1970, uh, started with the, the study of Al Quran and Islamic law in detail with the logic, grammar, rhetoric, and how to calculate the faces of the moon and so on. So finally, the university became the chief center of Arabic literature and Islamic learning in the world. So many of the people from Muslim from all over the world uh, focused toward going to Al Azhar at that time. Only in 1961, uh, additional non-religious subjects were added to the curriculum. 
So currently, if you go to Azha, you can take most of the uh, conventional program or uh, technical technological program. You can take medicine, you can take uh, agriculture, economics, and other things. In fact, the the other university of Harawi in, in 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 Morocco, as what has been mentioned by by Tansri Professor. The Kepri Razak yesterday, more detail about the, this university. Uh, it started also with the Islamic um, Islamic University as a madrasa, and finally in 1963, uh, they, they incorporated some other program uh, to be called a full fledged university. The West, the Western people, they look at uh, uh, Azhar and uh, Akharawin. It's not a university until. Uh, it is converted into uh, a, a conventional program into, into the university, into the university curriculum. So the conventional university, uh, you know very well, Oxford is the oldest uh, university in the English speaking world and the world's second oldest university. And Oxford is one of the oldest conventional university established 100 years after Azhar. The university offers courses, all kinds of courses, archaeology and so on. Uh, but later on, uh, very lately, the, this university also do offer, do um, open center for Islamic studies uh, where the students from other parties can come and take courses at the center. And uh, what is meant by full flash is integrated Islamic university. So the first Islamic university, integrated Islamic university was established in Islamabad in 1982 and followed by International Islamic University of Malaysia. IIUM is the first integrated model of education in Malaysia. It was established in 1983. IUM was established on 1983 and founded upon the Islamic principles, Islamic values, are inculcated into the inculcated into the dis discipline. IUM offers both Islamic and modern courses based on integration and Islamization of knowledge. So all the subjects taught in the in IAUM are based on integration and Islamization of knowledge. So this is what they call a full flash uh, integrated Islamic university. Um, this is the conversion. Uh, this is an example of Insania University College or now UNISHAM. Uh, previously, it was a full fledged Islamic university where they offer Sharia, Usuluddin, Quran, Sunnah, and, and so on. And then in 2008, the university has been converted into a full fledged Islamic university where they offer medical program hospitality, um, engineering, business, summit banking, finance, and, and so on. All this program uh, uh, is taught based on integration of knowledge as what we mentioned before. So the objective of the Integrated Islamic University is to produce a well-rounded professional imbued with Islamic values and ethics without compromising their job skill and marketability. So this is very important because uh, we had problem, a student graduated with uh, uh, Islamic studies when they come back to the country, even to any, any country, not only in Malaysia, in Cambodia, they do not have the job because uh, they do not have the skill in other disciplines. So we want our students uh, to have Islamic studies plus uh, some other technical courses uh, in built with in the, the, the system. So uh, basically, uh, we are going to develop the Ummah so that uh, it will be uh, to achieve the progress in harmony with Islamic ideal. So the philosophy of the integrated Islamic University uh, as well has been drafted by IUM. If to achieve the above objective, the university must adopt a unified philosophy of education approach that is based on integration and Islamization of knowledge. In detail, Professor Aslam will give you 
uh, uh, the concept of integration Islamization. And I'm sure Professor Kamal Hassan is in this group. Yesterday he attended. He is one of the architect uh, for the Islamization of knowledge at the International Islamic University, uh, together with Professor Emeritus Datu Abdul Hamid Abu Sulaiman, who have been the rector of IUM for 10 years during the early, the middle, early stage of the university. Uh, factors involved in the transformation in the transformation process. If your university is a full-fledged Islamic studies base, and you want to convert that into a fully integrated integrated uh, Islamic university, so which is not easy, uh, you need the consent of the leadership, the chairman the board, the rector, if these people are not agreeable to what, what, what we want to do, it will not happen. In my case, when I was invited to in Sanya in uh, 2008 by the Chief Minister of Kedah, he has already given me the light that I will have to develop this university based on the model of international Islamic university based on full integration of Islamic university. So the green light has been given by the chairman. The chairman was the chief minister of the state. And then I as a rector, so we'll just follow what his instruction and we'll bring to the board, we'll be supported by him. So the number one case is factor is solved. And uh, we have to look at some other practicalities after that. Uh, for to develop the full uh, the, the the new program in that university, we need curriculum, and we need the people who is going to develop the curriculum. Of course, in my case, it was easy because I came from International Islamic University, for twenty five years over here, and I know the deans and the the directors of the program in IUM. So I came back to IUM get the help of um, most of the brothers from IUM. So we, we managed to take their curriculum and modify in such a way that the curriculum will match with our, our university. So of course we look at some other models as well. At that time we have um, a quiz model, we have a um, uh, OSIM model and so on. And then to develop that curriculum, we, have, we need the qualified people, qualified teaching staff. So the teaching staff that we have in the university at that time, they are all Islamic study, study based. They are graduate from Azhar. They are professors who have been recruited by the university from Al Azhar. All are based on Islamic studies. They wouldn't know that. So we need to find some of our colleagues to come and join the university. And first we have to do a recruitment of the human resource. At least for one program, one or two percent will come and we'll have a look at the curriculum that we are going to adopt. So human resource, we have to start from after the, before we develop the curriculum. We cannot ask other people, consultant to do, uh, to, to do, the, human, uh, to do the curriculum development. Uh, and finally, we don't have the people to come and teach. So that is very important aspect of human resource. What has been mentioned yesterday by Dr. Sakya and all the others, and by Dr. Uh, Professor Daud, uh, those are the, the, the later parts. After you get um, the human resource, then how are you going to develop them to be uh, committed so that they can be uh, they can stay longer and so on. And then the, after having human resource curriculum, and we need the teaching materials. Definitely, uh, we have to do uh, some uh, before that. We have to do some recruitment of, of staff. How many staff will be required uh, to handle uh, this program? We need that. And how many staff are already available uh, in Islamic uh, studies department can assist us with some of the, the subjects? Because the, um, the integration part, we have to do both Islamic and the conventional. And then teaching material. There were not much teaching materials. There were not many textbooks available. 
uh, except for some articles. And if the lecturers are newly recruited by the university, they might not understand that. So I have to do recruitment. Alhamdulillah, many of my friends um, who are retired from IUM and so on came and assist me in, uh, in join, by joining me and becoming the staff of the university. So Alhamdulillah, I got that. And of course, now it should not be any problem with the e-learning as had, has been mentioned by Prof. Ismawi and Prof. Masoud this morning, uh, will solve many of the problem. At that time, we were not thinking of the, having the e-learning e program, e uh, program or e-learning subjects and so on. And then after that, we have to look at the budget. Budget for recruiting the people, physical facilities. Uh, some, some program might require some physical facilities, lab and so on. The computer labs, uh, the uh, medical, the medical lab and so on. So this one, if the leadership, number one, has already agreed, so for us it would be easier, then we go back to the board and requesting all this uh, to, be, to be set up. And then number six, the starting date of implementation. So this is very, very important. Uh, when we want to start, we already have uh, established everything. And then start, we have to start with the recruitment of students. And what kind of students that you want to, to admit? Previously, we look at the students who are very good in Arabic to come and join this program. But the integrated program here in my university before, uh, the language instruction was uh, English and Arabic. So to come to the, this conventional, to this integrated program, we, we require English language as one of the requirements. So, Alhamdulillah, um, we managed to get the student based on, uh, they don't have to come from religious schools only, uh, with very good uh, understanding about Arabic and, 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 and Islamic. They can come from any conventional school, okay, from any national schools. So when they come, they are required to take the language requirement, maybe six months, some of them might require a year, especially when you have international students. I mean, to, to join this program. So lang language requirement is very important. That's what has been mentioned by other speakers as well, uh, by, also by Dr. Shukri Lamputeh yesterday and so on, many others. So, uh, okay. Um, now go back to the, where do we start? Where do we start? For, for, for us, we started with the undergraduate programs. It's easier to start with undergraduate uh, because it is an undergraduate university. Uh, we don't have many postgraduate programs. We don't have many highly qualified people to teach the postgraduate program. We have people with master's degree, uh, only one or two with PhD, and we started with undergraduate program. But there are some new Islamic universities started with postgraduate. For example, University of Islam Malaysia, WIM in Cyberjaya, started with postgraduate program. International Islamic University of Indonesia in Jakarta also started with postgraduate program. So it depends. So this is very important also. If you start with undergraduate programs, uh, what are the factors that are required in implementation? Do we need with a new, do you need to start with a new intake of student? Or perhaps with some student in year one or year two? For example, we already have students in the university in, in Islamic studies program. Are they allowed to take the integrated program? Maybe if they are in year one or year two, it's still possible. But they might miss, uh, they might have to go and extend it for, instead of four years become five years. But it's good that to take a fresh student for, for year one, starting from year one. And the number of students we should admit, we should admit one class of student or two classes. So this also depends on the number of lecturers who are ready to teach the courses offered. Either the lecturers who are already in the Islamic program, they can take some courses, or we have to recruit new, uh, new lecturers in, 
new lecturers um, based on the discipline that we are offering. And uh, lecturers factor, mm. how many lecturers are we ready, are uh, available to assist in this new program, which means the lecturers were already there, how many we have to count, how many lecturers need to be recruited to teach at least uh, the first two semesters. So that's important. And we have to stand by for the future. Mm -hmm. Many, how many young lecturers need to be recruited with a bachelor's degree that will be sent for master's or with master's degree, degree to be sent for PhD and so on. So these are the preparation for the lecturers, not only for the first year, second year, third year, and so on. And then, um, for if you start with the postgraduate program, uh, maybe it will be easier. The number of student intake may not be large. Normally, a postgraduate classes will not be many. For example, when I was teaching in Islam Malaysia, UIM, uh, I have only about eight students in the class. And majority of them are doing uh, by research, not by coursework. It happened I was teaching the research methodology, which is required by all the students. Uh, so this is the course that um, uh, to be taken by uh, required courses by all the students. So the number of courses to be taken by the student may, may not be many. And if the program is by research, no teaching is required. So some require teaching, some require one or two courses required there. So lecturers factor, lecturers must be with a minimum qualification of PhD to teach or to supervise the graduate student. Mm -hmm. It is important. When you start with postgraduate, that means you start recruiting lecturers minimum with PhD. That's very important because after second year, they are hot, or maybe the third semester, the student will be required to, to start on their research. Normally, after two semesters, they have to start submitting the research proposal and so on. So starting with graduate studies, uh, this is the, the problem that we have. If we don't have enough resources at PhD level, it, it will be difficult. So we take the model of integration or Islamization at the Kuliah of Islamic Arabian Knowledge in Human Sciences at IUM. We take the, uh, the Kuliah of Islamic Arabian Knowledge in Human Sciences, they have two division. One, the first division is Islamic Ribi Knowledge Division, Islamic Ribi Knowledge and Heritage, the, which uh, have uh, three, four departments, Fake and Usul Fake, Usuluddin, Quran and Sunnah, Arabic Language and Literature. That means the students who are in this department will graduate, in this division will graduate with a bachelor in these four disciplines. And they have also human sciences, division and they have one two three four five six seven uh, uh, six uh, program over here political science psychology sociology communication history and uh, english language literature so the student in the human sciences division will graduate with bachelor of human sciences so the the, the technique of uh, the the process of islamization taking place here the student in review knowledge division or with the program and review knowledge are required to take certain number of courses from the human sciences. This is a requirement. Before you, you graduate, you have to take some courses from the human sciences. And similarly, uh, and then student can choose for a second major or second degree in the human sciences. Student of Islamic review knowledge can graduate with, bach uh, with Bachelor of Fake and Usul Fake. Uh, but they are also taking either political science, psychology, and so on. And then after that, they can opt to have a major in psychology and whatever it is, and even to have second degree in, in human sciences. So this is, uh, that means student from Ruby Knowledge can have Bachelor of Ruby Knowledge and Bachelor of Human Sciences together. Uh, this is where the period may have to, to be added, maybe instead of four years, four and a half years. Similarly, students in human sciences are required to take certain number of courses from the review knowledge. Students can choose for a second major or second degree in Islamic review knowledge. Students from human sciences will graduate, but they are required to take certain courses in review knowledge, the minimum. And then they can choose to have a major 
in Ruby knowledge or to have a second degree in Ruby knowledge. This much has been done by many of our students. Uh, they have the choice. The other model for integration and Islamization at IUM is in the Kulia Economics and Management Sciences, where I used to be there uh, for almost 25 years. And finally, I became the Dean of the Kulia. And the structure of the program, I think it, I'll take one example, Bachelor of Economics. So they, they have the university required courses, about 20. This philosophy, values, history, soft skills, nation studies, community engagement, and so on. And the Kulia required courses. They are required to take 38 credits and department required courses and department elective packages. So for the total now requirement for graduation is 133 credits for Malaysian and 131 for non-Malaysian. So this is because of the language requirement and so on, the Malay language. For the university required uh, courses, 20 credits. Uh, this you have the Tamadun Islam, Tamadun Asia, Hubungan Ethnic, Bahasa Malaysia, and so on. So these are the required courses for all the students in the faculty. There are three programs: economics, business, and accounting. All are the same. And then you have Kulia required courses, which is also compulsory for all the students in the Kulia. Financial accounting and so on. These are on business and and on the economic, economic business accounting will be required by all the students. And then uh, they have department required courses. Those who are in department of economics, they have certain number of courses to be taken, department of accounting and so on. And then they have elective required. So this is additional to, to what before the graduation, they are required to complete 15 credits. So the process of Islamization taking place here, every course is presented from an Islamic perspective. Western economic theories will be presented and then crit critically analyzed from an Islamic viewpoint. Number one. Number two, program generally adopts a compar comparative approach. They do the comparison between conventional and the Islamic. The program hope to devalue economic concept from all alien, met alien matters and infuse Islamic values where it is possible. So this is quite difficult for some universities who have the lecturer who do not have the exposure to this. So uh, to recruit the lecturers into this program in for a new university, you need to have uh, people who graduate from this program, integrated base or people who have experience in teaching the program. So number four, the program has certain core subjects, whatever Akida, Sharia, and Akla, which are made, made compulsory to all. Arabic language is central to the objective of the program. All of them are required to, uh, to complete certain number of credit for Arabic. And after the strong foundation in Islamic perspective in economic, the fourth year courses are more conventional in nature. The reason is that in economic, uh, the fourth year courses are highly technical with the model, theory, and so on. Uh, not much value. Value has been incorporated in the elementary courses. So to ensure the correct understanding, a limited number of options are offered. So the options for the student to graduate. So similar approach are done for the Kulia, in the Kulia Economic for Bachelor of Business Administration and Bachelor of Accounting. So I'm not go, going to details on this. So these are some of the things that we have to take into consideration uh, in the process of transformation from Islamic studies based to a fully integrated Islamic university. I think with that, I end my uh, presentation first and then any question we can discuss further. Thank you very much, Dr. Brian. I give yeah. back. <coughs> Jazakumullah khairan. We express our higher thanks to Dr. Wira, Professor Dr. Jamil Osman, who has a very excellent presentation with the priceless uh, and invaluable knowledge that we gain from his presentation. But of course, we're still on the topic on the curriculum tra transformation and integrated uh, Islamic university. But uh, another part will be fulfilled by Professor Dr. Muhammad Aslam, the current director of the Academic Development Division of the 
International Institute of Islamic Thought, East and Southeast Asia. So I would like to call upon Professor Muhammad uh, Aslam to, feel, to fulfill the second part, and then later on we go to the question and answer, please. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim, um, Dr. Jamil. Uh, thank you very much for the very comprehensive overview of our topic. Uh, my presentation will actually be a, a small part of what uh, Dr. Jamil presented just now, but I will focus um, into one of the challenges um, in the area that was covered by uh, Dr. Jamil is now, uh, and that is um, the importance of the human resource element um, and how uh, I would argue that uh, if we talk about uh, university education in general, and in particular if we are talking about um, you know, the the agenda in an integrated Islamic university, I would argue that uh, really the, the human resource component is, is the most important. Because if you look at all the other um, you know, aspects of a, of a university, um, whether it is curriculum, uh, whether it is um, leadership, um, you know the administrative side, mm -hmm. uh, even the, the you know the funding uh, aspects. At the end of the day, it all boils down to the to the people that you have in the university, and therefore, I, I personally I feel um, in any university, uh, the core um, factor is going to be the you know the the, the teachers that you have. Of course, the administrators are equally important, and and I would be the first to to agree. But but really, in terms of you know what the university will achieve, I think you know the focus is is basically going to be on the the academics that you have. Uh, I, I will very briefly touch uh, these three issues. Um, one is um, you know what and why do we talk about Islamization of knowledge? Um, and, and this is really something that we do in, uh, you know, in a whole one-day session where we discuss what is IOK and how it involves curriculum. So I will very briefly just touch this. Uh, you know, uh, secondly, I will I will um, I will introduce this idea, um, which uh, has become uh, I think uh, the the new agenda of Triple IT, and that is uh, integration of knowledge which is made up, and I will try to present this, Prof. Kamal is here, so I, I will, will leave him to, to give his inputs and comment and, and to make correction to what I'm going to say. Uh, the Islamization, relevantization, which is the term we use in IIUM, and try to connect it with what we should be trying to do in curriculum, um, whether or not we, we want to develop um, what is termed as uh, transdisciplinary knowledge. In other words, when we want to offer curriculum, the bodies of knowledge that we are developing may need to be new bodies of knowledge because existing bodies of knowledge cannot represent what you want to do in an Islamic university. So this this is maybe again I will, you know, I I'm not going to do justice to this topic. It's a very brief um, uh, overview, and then the third part is actually to try and see. Um, the relationship between curriculum and human resource. And I will give an example in the area of Islamic finance. Uh, I, I come from economics uh, background, and therefore uh, was involved in a few studies uh, looking at our, our human resource, or what we call uh, the talent that we have in universities in the area of Islamic finance education. And, and very interesting results about this. And, I, and although the example is from... Islamic finance education, uh, I think the same issues can also be extended to all other areas uh, in the human sciences. Yeah? Uh, we, will, we will have the same issues. Yeah? So, so let's, let's move uh, into the topic. Um, what is this integration of knowledge or Islamization of knowledge uh, as it was known previously? 
um, it is a program, an agenda uh, process um, that will develop contemporary bodies of knowledge through a critical interaction, or sometimes we, we use the term dialogue, between uh, modern knowledge, and in the case of universities, I think we are talking about the modern disciplines that we have with Turaf al-Islam. So it's that interaction that we are that we are talking about when we when we use the term uh, Islamization of knowledge or currently integration of knowledge. But I think it's very important for us to keep in mind that this uh, interaction um, is not just about the substantive body of knowledge about the theories. It's not only about the theories, but it also has to involve the foundations of those disciplines. Yeah. So, so uh, when you want to develop Islamic economics or um, you know, sociology or political science, um, not only do you need to talk about what is taught in the textbooks that we have, but since we want to critically evaluate that body of knowledge, it has to include the foundations of that discipline. So I think this is, this is another very important point to keep in mind when we relate it to curriculum and the human resource needed. Um, IOK is also, and this is sometimes often not stressed enough, it is also a critical evaluation of our own Torah. Um, something that maybe sometimes, uh, you know, some of us are a little bit more um, reserved to say this. Yeah? But, but if you look at the agenda that was put forward, especially uh, by uh, IT, um, you will see that it has a need to, you know, to look seriously and critically at our uh, Islamic tradition and heritage yeah? um, and, and to, to also have a critical evaluation of, of that as well. It is a critique of modern disciplines as well as a critical self-assessment from Islamic viewpoint or viewpoints yeah? because I think that is another challenge that we face. There are, there are maybe people who have been exposed to the, the Islamic worldview uh, differently. And therefore, when they look at modern disciplines and when they look at our Torah, they sometimes evaluate it in different ways, right? Um, I mean, simple example, I know in economics, we have uh, some scholars who feel that we just need to throw out everything from modern economics. So they don't look at modern economics as being able to give anything to Islamic economics. And, and, and I think many of us, including myself, I, I don't agree with this because I would not consider that to be um, Islamization of knowledge. So critical interaction is needed. Now, this agenda, if we agree that this is what Islamization of knowledge is, it has big implications on curriculum and human resource requirements that is the academics and the teachers that we that we have in in our university why do we need iok well um, i think this is quite straightforward um, the major proponents of islamization of knowledge in the 19 uh, late 70s and early 80s um, you know we we basically all know this statement um, the, the source of our problems is knowledge and education in the Muslim world, the dichotomy that we have in our in our countries, in our nations, uh, between your religious education and your you know modern or national education system. Uh, and unfortunately, what we teach in those um, universities, the modern universities or the national universities, um, they are not value free. Yeah, they are not ideology free and therefore there is the need for us to critically evaluate it before we can say that this is um, you know, knowledge that is coming from an Islamic perspective. Similarly, when we look at the, um, the other input, which is the, what is called in many uh, you know, contemporary um, uh, literature, when we talk about Islamic knowledge or Islamic education, uh, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Jamil just now, we are referring to the traditional uh, 
the traditional universities, uh, or as Prof Kamal has uh, you know put it very nicely in his paper on IIUM um, on Islamic studies, which um, is something that you know is is again not in line with with the holistic view of education from an Islamic uh, viewpoint. This is what we need to do if we are talking about the integrated university that Dr. Jamil mentioned. Um, we want to have contemporary bodies of knowledge or disciplines. Okay? So if we're talking about human sciences, sociology, political science, communication, um, uh, you know, economics, I would put economics there as well. Um, this is what we want to develop. But at the same time, uh, we have these two inputs. We have the modern disciplines that generally come from the West. And for these disciplines, we need to undertake this process of Islamization. But then you also have the, the Torah, yeah? um, and that also needs to be critically evaluated. And in IIUM, we, we use the term relevantization. So both these two inputs have to be integrated. Um, this, I think, we may need to have more discussion and clarity so that you know we can try to make sense of this. Um, so, so that that is what is demanded of the academics, yeah, the the, the human resource that you have in universities. Yeah? So, I agree that that an integrated university has all different dimensions, but I would argue, really, in essence, this is what is the core of the challenge that we face. How do we develop contemporary bodies of knowledge that represent the Islamic viewpoint? What we do have, as mentioned, you know, I think again by Dr. Jamil just now, um, today in the Muslim world, whether you are in uh, Malaysia or Indonesia or any of you know, the countries that we are in, or even in the West, you have a certain curriculum framework. Um, you take three to four years to study for a bachelor's degree. Um, and generally, the, the graduation requirement you know, varies between 120 to 140. Maybe in Indonesia, there are some universities that go up to 150 as well in order to graduate with a, with a first degree. Yeah? Um, and as mentioned by Dr. Jamil, all these components, university courses, kuliah courses, department courses, and then electives, right? Now, if we are having or we want to have an integrated university, uh, Islamic university that offers integrated curriculum, right? if that's what we want, then one first decision that we need to, to decide when you're developing that curriculum is you know how many courses will be modern knowledge how many will come from the heritage and the most important component would be how many courses are able and represent this integrated course or content within a four-year time frame this is another another big challenge right I know there were some universities including uh, uh, our colleagues in Islamabad um, and even uh, colleagues in Iran, uh, when in the I remember in the in the mid '80s when we had some discussion with them, we found out that you know they were very ambitious. In order to get a first degree, uh, it was 180 credit hours or something like that. A very very high number of courses, and you need you did, you needed to take five years or six years to complete your first degree. Why? because they wanted to give so many courses in, in both these two areas, right? So um, I think this, this is a very important lesson as well. When you want to design curriculum, uh, we also have to talk about ideals and realities, um, what kind of graduates you want to produce within the, the, the time constraint as well. Yeah, this is a reality, right? Um, the model of an Islamic university, I think uh, that you mentioned already, we have this Islamic studies, and I think um, this is uh, inheritance that we get from our days under colonial rule. Um, but unfortunately, we do have 
Well, I, I shouldn't say unfortunately because these institutions do play a role um, and an important role um, where, you know, these traditional madrasa, pondo or pesantren, uh, they do, um, you know, provide um, uh, sometimes very in-depth uh, uh, knowledge and exposure to those areas of usuluddin, of fiqh and usul fiqh, um, maybe even tasawuf, yeah. So they, they do play a role, yeah. Um, and in 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 most Muslim minority countries, uh, this would probably be private colleges. I think um, we had uh, two examples yesterday. Uh, although in the case of uh, University of Fatani, I think they are trying to go uh, beyond that traditional Islamic studies by also uh, trying to incorporate what I call the new model or the you know the reform model, uh, which is trying to include the IOK agenda, where we talk about uh, all disciplines. So you have, um, you know, faculty of economics or faculty of uh, social sciences, but what you teach is not only the conventional um, economics or finance or sociology, but it is actually Islamic perspective whether you include it in the name of the degree i think this is another issue uh, a lot of it depends on the you know the requirements of the of the state authorities i think in indonesia um, you know they 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 need to put islamic economics in their degree program to differentiate it from the economics program yeah but in our case in iium because we are an islamic university we just call our degree economics but because it's an Islamic university, we assume, and not only assume, but it has to be uh, giving an Islamic perspective. All right. So, so this IOK agenda has again right, to 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 stress again, um, you know, implications on curriculum and human resource, especially the the teachers. I agree. Also, a lot of it depends on the students, etc. But I think when we are talking about developing curriculum, uh, we are talking about the academics. Okay, so again, the same diagram just now, but now this is where the academics play a big role. Um, what do you take from Torah? What do you take from modern knowledge? How much do you take from the Torah? How much do you take from modern knowledge? Um, and do we have the academics who are able to bring these two together? Now, this is a very important point because let me just share with you. I think that uh, Jamil talked about the Kulia of Islamic Legal Knowledge and Human Sciences, where they had these two divisions, the IRKH and the Human Sciences. In the early model, they required students to do a major in one and the minor in you know in the other in the other division. So if somebody wanted to do, let's say, uh, a Bachelor of uh, Political Science, they would have to do a minor in Islamic review of knowledge and heritage. Um, I, I hope I'm getting that right. Um, uh, but yes, I think there was a requirement. Similarly, in, in the Kulia of Economics, we also tried to uh, introduce a double degree or double major where somebody does a Bachelor of Economics and then would also get a second degree or a second major in IRKH, right? Um, but you know the 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 challenge and the feedback that we got from students who attended these uh, double degree economics and IRKH was that they found that the courses that were being offered from the the Kulia of Islamic Review Knowledge and Heritage they were quite uh, what, what word to use they were quite separate from from what they were studying in economics there was the connection was not made all right so what you actually had was students were doing additional courses okay but these additional courses were just additions you know there, there was there was hardly any integration involved all right and i think this is a this is a major issue that that you know we need to to address if we are talking about integrated curriculum and an integrated university it cannot mean just additions okay 
instead of doing 120 credit hours or 130 credit hours, you just increase it to 160, 170, and you think by giving more and more courses in the Torah and modern knowledge that somehow or other you are creating this integration. Uh, it may not happen, right? So, so keep that in mind. Um, in our attempt to develop this integrated knowledge, then what approach do we take, right? In most um, uh, traditional universities that we have in all over the world, if you study economics, you will do economics from A to Z, right? Um, you rarely go beyond the economics uh, discipline, um, and you then try to give some Islamic inputs. So this is a monodisciplinary uh, you know, approach. Uh, it's getting more and more, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, popular now. People talk about multidisciplinary approaches, right? And interdisciplinary approaches. Okay, Th these are these are two separate things. Multidisciplinary. We are adding, as we did maybe in the Bachelor of Economics and IRK, we added some some uh, courses from the other side, but there was no integration mm -hmm. interdisciplinary yes there is some degree of integration so i think that's maybe what we need to do more and mm -hmm. maybe in the future we really have to talk about transdisciplinary approach where we are actually creating new courses and ultimately even new disciplines okay and and this may require us um you know to even go to the level of a reclassification of knowledge yeah, that, that we have. Uh, um, let me move on because time is uh, running short. Uh, the final point that I, or the final slides that I want to talk about, are we able to do this big task of integration um, in curriculum with our existing human resources, all right? And is there a mismatch? Now, um, I, I'm going to use the um, project that, that I worked on a few years ago, um, it was a project funded by the Malaysian government to look at Islamic finance education. Um, we call the report the uh, Malaysia Islamic Finance Education Report, MIFA. And uh, it was published by the International Council of Islamic Finance Educators. Uh, the second version of the second edition was uh, published in 2018 with some minor changes, but really the data is, is I think, very, very interesting and, and hopefully, uh, you know, you will see what I'm talking about. Uh, we covered in our second study 19 universities in Malaysia um, with variety of programs, right, uh, having Islamic finance as its focus. Um, and um, we managed to look in these 19 universities to get the feedback of 402 academics, all right? So 402 academics are in Islamic finance education, all right? Now, just a couple of tables. Now, if we call a degree Islamic finance, okay, whether it is Bachelor of Science Islamic finance or Bachelor of Islamic Finance, right? If we if we want to use this nomenclature in your curriculum, in our discussion uh, in, with our colleagues, we said that you need at least these five domains, mm -hmm. which are very, very important. There could be six. Yeah? You could have uh, people who feel that we need um, ICT and so on, and that's fine. But the core areas are these five, right? Now, if we use this terminology, in terms of curriculum, that 120 credit hours or 140 credit hours that we do for your undergraduate, what is the percentage of courses that will fall in these five domains? Um, maybe this is the wrong face-to-face. -face, I would have asked you and you would have put your hands up and told me, right? But let me just do away with that. Generally, if it is a, a Islamic finance nomenclature that you use, you would expect the major to be 40 to 50 percent right and then all the other related areas management economics accounting sharia and law about 10 to 15 percent i mean this is a, you know a very general this is what we we discussed in our group all right now 
if you are having this as your curriculum, then you need people to teach, right? Now, if you have 50, 40 to 50% people in banking and finance background, how do we define banking and finance background? Undergraduate in banking and finance or Islamic banking and finance, okay? Or maybe economics, and then you have taken you know, some specialization in finance. But basically, if you say banking and finance, means you should have people who are knowledgeable in banking and finance, right? And this is what we got for the 402 academics that we, that we surveyed, mm -hmm. looking at their background, looking at their publication, looking at their research. This is what we got. There were only 26% of academics who were, in our definition, coming from banking and finance background. Okay, and then 15% economics, 12% management, 7% uh, accounting and governance. But look at Sharia and law, 40%. So we had, we have in Malaysia, uh, under representation of people in banking and finance, teaching. Islamic banking and finance, and we have an over-representation of people in Sharia teaching banking and finance. Now, what, what we can interpret from this, maybe we need to leave it to question time, uh, but what I want to show is that this human resource challenge is important challenge. We must be able to have people who are teaching that understand not only the Torah, but also the modern discipline, and must be able to integrate it coherently um, and present it as a valid body of knowledge, right? So what are the lessons learned? I think um, maybe this also covers in a way uh, Dr. Jamil's presentation. What kind of Islamic university do you want to have? Is it that traditional Islamic studies university or an Islamic university that has the IOK agenda. Uh, I think these two Islamic universities are, are quite different philosophically uh, from a curriculum perspective, as well as from the type of human resource that you will need. Uh, I, I just I remembered the university in uh, in Holland yesterday, Netherlands. Um, they were offering um, Quranic studies. Um, Arabic studies and I think uh, spiritual caring or something. I think the kind of person that you would need for Quranic studies or Arabic studies would be very different than if you wanted to offer Islamic finance. What are your students going, sorry, where are your students going to come from? The pool of students coming in, are they coming from religious schools or are they coming from the national type schools, mm -hmm. right? What kind of curriculum do you want and what kind of graduates do you want to produce? I think that point was, was mentioned by, by Dr. Jamil. What are the language requirements? If you have to have exposure to Torah, at the same time, modern knowledge, English and Arabic would almost be necessary, right? Uh, besides the direct subject matter, what other subjects would you require students to take? And you have to do that all in four years. <laughs> this is another major constraint, yeah? All institutions wanting to develop integrated curriculum and IOK approach, I think, has to have to plan their their human resource, uh, you know, uh, needs. Um, it has to be based on the nomenclature of the proposed program. Yeah, whether you call it Bachelor Islamic Finance or if you call it Bachelor of Fiqh, Banking and Finance, then you may need to have people in Sharia or, or FIC to teach primarily because it's a Bachelor of FIC. But if it is a Bachelor of Islamic Finance, maybe different. What kind of academics would you need? Yeah, uh, What would their specializations be? Would we require them to be able to integrate knowledge, yeah, i.e. either to Islamize or to relevantize? Yeah. If yes, then we need to do what is mentioned in the uh, Islamization work plan of Triple IT. They have to master Torah and they have to master modern discipline. This is this is a major you know challenge. Yeah, and there are many more other requirements. So in conclusion, I think you know this process of of 
integrated education, setting up integrated universities, um, you know, numerous challenges exist, but it's something that we need to do, right? There has to be continuous reforms, especially in curriculum. And for that, you need the right people, right? And, and you know, when, when there is a demand to expand and expand and to, to you know, to provide people to, um, you know, the various industries, then the challenge is the teachers that you have. Right. It's it's not easy. And this requires constant stop taking, identifying gaps and taking corrective measures. I end with this, uh, my favorite phrase, I say it in all sessions, um, my interview with Professor Latas in early 90s, I, co I complained to him that I was in a se seminar and, um, you know, this critique of Islamization of knowledge said, after 10 years, what have you guys done? I don't see any you know, textbook, or I don't see any uh, real significant, um, uh, you know, contribution that you have made. And Professor Latas, you know, had this very uh, interesting statement. If we do it correctly, it will take two generations yeah, to achieve our goals. If we do it correctly. So I'm quite sure Professor Latas was of the view that we were not doing it correctly. So, so more than two generations. Now, whether you want to count the number of years and so on, I think what it says is that it takes, it's going to take, it's going to take time, but we have to be able to, you know, to make sure that we get the right people and we need to have programs for those people. Wallahu alam, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> Jazakumullah khairan to both Professor Jamie Rosman and Prof. Aslam for the very clear presentation until no summary is needed. And uh, before we go to question and answer, I don't know whether Prof. Kamal Hassan is here or not. If uh, Prof. want to add something, you are very welcome. But if no, comment, I will go to the chat box for the question and answer. Because on the screen, I can see only a few percent. I cannot see all. If uh, Prof. Kamal Hassan or Bamid Abu Sulaiman are here, bro admin of this program, please let me know. Can we request for Kamal to say a few words? Yes, yes. Prof. Prof. Kamal. Unmute yourself. While waiting for him, we can open up to questions. Okay, since time is very limited, I cannot uh, uh, ask all questions on the chat box. I may select few and the rest I will uh, later on, I will give to presenter to answer later on to all of you. Okay, uh, Assalamu alaikum. How can the integration of knowledge in Islam really be based on the Quran and Hadith, but can also adopt Western theory selectively? Uh, because what appears at the university is that there is still no balance between Islamic knowledge and the concept of Western science. Jazakumullah khairan. Okay, Prof. Uh, Jamil Usman, you want to answer this question? Aslam, answer first. Oh. Okay, Aslam, please. Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, I, I'm not too sure what is meant by balance uh, between Islamic knowledge and concept of Western science. But I think what, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, we need people who are comfortable with both inputs. Right. Definitely, if you are talking about kuliah of Islamic radio knowledge, especially in the in the division of Islamic radio knowledge and heritage, yeah, the fiqh and usul fiqh, the Quran and Sunnah, the usuluddin, uh, certainly they would have to have more uh, expertise mm -hmm. in in you know their area, but they would also need to be able to know something about human sciences. 
right? So they, they, they must be ha having exposure to human sciences because at the end of the day, you want to relevantize your, your disciplines to solve the, you know, the problems of, of society today. Um, you know, I, I, I think that Jamil mentioned it, uh, that, you know, today universities are required to provide, uh, you know, people with um, uh, jobs that, that solve problems, you know, and, and, uh, and you're able to, um, you know, to be agents of change. This is the, the term that, you know, early batches in IUM will remember, Prof. Kamal, you know, was always talking about this. So how do you become an agent of change if you are not being able to, to provide the solutions from an Islamic perspective? And as uh, Tansri Zul mentioned yesterday, you know, this whole idea of, of uh, Rahmatan Lil Alameen, yeah, how can you be uh, uh, Rahmah if you are not able to solve these problems in a way that, you know, that uh, benefits from both these two bodies of knowledge? Um, and I also saw, you know, Dr. Zuljastri, I think, was asking about something very particular to IIUM about the, the soft academic framework that we have developed in IIUM. Uh, how, will, how will it then add another requirement, you know, to human resource? Um, I, I have to admit I, I'm not as, um, as uh, well-versed with the, with the soft, with the uh, academic framework. Sejahtera academic framework, um, but yeah, I'm sure it it would require at least knowledge of these two, and probably also the ability to translate it into society, right? So that's another additional. Not only does the person have to have knowledge of Torah and also modern knowledge, but must be able to convey it through actions, right? This is a this is another you know, academics are maybe very good at theories and you know, uh, but can we go down to the to the society and solve, uh, solve you know actual problems. I think this is the challenge. Yeah, so both is both are needed and maybe more. Right. So maybe at that I, I stop here and maybe Datu can can add. Want, Datu want to add something? Yes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So when you talk about Islamization of knowledge, you know, uh, especially in in our kuliah economics, so not all the the Western economics uh, has to be criticized in such a way that uh, they are not right. Some not some Western uh, knowledge are not contradictory to Islam, so we can we don't have to to approach uh, to go into detail into that. If the knowledge is contradict to Islamic uh, principle or uh, Islamic views, then we have to adopt. We have to do some modification. Some Western model, for example, in economics, requires some modified model which bring in the Islamic values. So when you talk about Islamization of knowledge, it doesn't mean that 100% uh, of the knowledge that was um, uh, uh, de uh, developed by the West, 100% uh, uh, cannot be used. So there are some value-free uh, knowledge uh, for example, like mathematics and and, and, and some model, uh, whatever it is, the mathematical model and so on. So, but some requ require some modification. So we took into that. So not knowledge, every, everything has to be uh, Islamized. Okay. Uh, is it possible to integrate Islamic value to general language study, like English language? And is the integration involving medicine and general theory of education? So, Datu or Prof. Aslam want to answer this question? Aslam will go first. Uh, Prof. Yeah. Aslam. Uh, you know, I, I, it's both, both are not my area. I think Prof. Kasuli will be the best to answer <laughs> it. Uh, he will be speaking, inshallah, this evening. Although he's going to talk about banking and finance, so I, <laughs> I will be very interested to know what he says about that. But, you know, this is probably better okay. you know, addressed to him. Okay, okay. Uh, we, that means we keep some question to be answered by Prof. Kasole, but this this question must be answered by Prof. Aslan. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Aslan, mention your name. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I want to ask how to integrate, uh, integrate graduates of the Islamic banking 
finance and economic with, with industry because in the case of Indonesia, graduates of Islamic economic are still slightly absorbed into the industry. All right. Um, I, I'm not sure um, if I'm getting it correctly. My, my, my understanding is that uh, Islamic banking and finance uh, is booming in Indonesia. Uh, there is a huge demand for for graduates from Islamic economics uh, programs. Uh, if, if you're talking about the graduates from Islamic economics programs in conventional banks, maybe this, this could be the case. But as far as Islamic banks concerned, I, I was informed by, you know, by our colleagues who, who are in Indonesia that, that, you know, all their programs are in are in huge demand. I mean, it, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one particular example in uh, Institute uh, Pertanian Bogor, which is one of the premier universities in Indonesia, I remember we were, we were told that, and also in Ilanga, both these two universities, um, the Islamic economics program, uh, at least a couple of years ago, was the number one uh, demanded program, you know, uh, applications outnumbering the positions you know many many times um so i i i thought it was actually very good demand um but having said that you need to create also the the jobs in the market right so so whatever you do in universities so that's why this this planning has also got to be in the number of graduates that you are producing if you keep on taking in people in one area and you find that you know there are no jobs for them outside then it's bad planning so at the national level i suppose there has to be better planning if you want them to work in the industry having said that you can also talk about entrepreneurship so you may do a, a course in islamic banking or finance we don't work in a bank but you set up your own business and you you know you do you do uh, entrepreneurship i think that's the way forward uh, move to uh, working for yourself, yeah? not not necessarily working for the government or working for you know any particular bank, but be your own boss and implement your knowledge of integrated curriculum into your into your business. Prof. Jamil, want to add something? Uh, I think that's answered. The okay. only one, the first question that he was asking about. How the integration of knowledge uh, is integrated in the medical program? Yes, the best person to answer on this is Professor Omar. He was the one who developed the medical program at IUM and also in Brunei, where integration of knowledge is uh, is taking place. So he is also the the chairman of the ethic committee in and in, in Riyadh in in King Fahad University. So basically, in those uh, program. Uh, uh, the Islamic ethics for the medical doctors is, is more important than, than that Islamization. So as in, in a profession, I, my first profession was um, being a statistician. So um, until I'm, I'm old now, only I realized that how important the ethic in the profession of statistics. So many of the statisticians uh, has been just misuse of the uh, statistician or statistical users misuse uh, statistic. So there is no wrong with statistic. How we make use of statistic is uh, is very important. So what they did is that even the postgraduate student now can manipulate the data uh, from insignificant to become significant by by slight changes in the uh, in the data. So this is very unethical. So it, it, it can happen also at the um, higher level, for example, at statistic department level and so on. Uh, supposing that the government of the day want the, um, the, the per capita income, for example, uh, to be increased. So we do some modifications uh, that the data can be can be improved. I don't think they will do that. But if there are statisticians who are not um, ethical, uh, this thing can happen. So same thing with medical and other profession. Medical ethic is very, and uh, the ethic in the profession is very important, and it's one of the important subjects to be offered by uh, by the faculty. 
Thank you very much. Okay, <clears throat> uh, we have. Uh, I have to borrow the saying of Alatas at the conclusion of Professor Aslam. We say that if all questions answered by by this session, how about the role of other session? Let other session answer some question uh, raised uh, during our session. Okay, uh, Professor Professor Kamal Hassan is here. If uh, Professor want to add something, you are very most welcome, Prof. Can I ask you a, a few questions? One questions. So. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, question from Thank Brother you. Osman. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah, Osman. Yeah. Ah, yes. Thank you for Dr. Jamal as well as Professor Aslam. Very enlightening uh, explanation about the integration of knowledge. But uh, I wanted to, to ask, in the case of a professional, they have the professional body as assuming associate, example, associate of institute of statistician, associate institute of accounting, associate institute of uh, banking, or another one is actuaries and so on. They have their own domain of professional and they have their own domain of courses and they keep to themselves. How could uh, we, as uh, to integrate Islamic values into this profession? Because the student, the profession that they learn from this uh, institution by themselves through the association. So I just like to ask Professor Jamal as well as Professor Aslam. Okay, you address this question to both of speakers. Yes, thank okay, you. Okay, Prof. Jamil first. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Prof. Yeah. I think he is the one, he is an expert in that. That's why he's asking us. So, looking at brother Dr. Sayah, he's a practical man. I realized that he resigned from the becoming the statistical officer in the early 70s because uh, contradict to his boss. So that is, uh, that at that time, we were not talking about ethics yet, about medical, about Islamic ethics. So there are two kind of ethics here. There is one uh, Islamic ethic, one of medical ethics, uh, the Western ethics. The Islamic ethic uh, basically we are responsible to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. That mean uh, whatever the good the the good deed that we do will be rewarded, the bad deed will be punished. So it is important that uh, for the Western ethic, they are only responsible to the to their own profession. Uh, maybe to medical association, to uh, accounting association, and so on. But these people are not uh, responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is important, we have to inject the Islamic ethic to the profession which make them responsible to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, I think that's my answer to Professor Sayah's uh, question. Thank you very much. Okay, Professor Aslam. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shaya. I think I was looking for Prof. Malia. I thought I saw her earlier, but maybe she, she has left. She would be the ideal person because I think she's involved a lot in the Malaysian Institutes of Accountants and so on. Yeah? Um, you know, I, I remember when I came back after my PhD and um, there was so much talk about uh, professional bodies because they were, they were, you know, they were looking at our curriculum and so on. And, and uh, I, I jokingly, I told at that time, discussing with uh, colleagues at that time, I said, why don't we set up um, Chartered Institute of Islamic Educators? Okay? And we become professional, whatever that means. Uh, and we give our own, um, you know, our own um, recognition to what we consider to be a, a professional, integrated, curriculum yeah um and then we we deal with the other professional bodies because i i personally when i when i ask myself i consider economics to be a professional discipline uh, but we don't have a uh, institute or chartered institute of you know, uh, economics um but accountants do uh, marketers do yeah, um, finance, I think they're still trying to get professional qualification, although not recognized. Engineers do. So what, what is it that makes it professional? I, I'm not too sure, but let's set up our own professional uh, association and recognize our qualifications and then sell it to the market. I mean, that's going to be the tough part. Yeah? Thank you very much. 
Okay, it is clear. Is it clear, Professor Sakya? Or you want to answer your own question by your own self? I think I think very 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 interesting. Very clear. But Doctor Doctor Aslam has mentioned that we need to establish mm -hmm. our own association or yes. body association. Very interesting. That we should have to work toward that. And where Doctor Doctor Jamil has mentioned that we have to build Islamic values into this our own association. It's a very interesting one. I think very yeah. good ideas. Okay. Thank you very much for the view. Okay. Okay, uh, still we have time around seven minutes. It's better to give uh, to both speaker to give a closing remark for your own uh, presentation, Professor Jamil, around not more than three minutes, Prof. Jamil Usman. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Dr. Ibrahim, for allowing me to close with three, three minutes. So I think the, the topic is very important, uh, what we are discussing. Uh, this morning because um, many of the islamic universities would like to follow or to follow or to transform their their university into what you call integrated based islamic university but they do not know uh, the implication of that if the islamic universities that existing now is already very big with 20,000 students, full-fledged Islamic university with 20,000 students. To convert that into full integrated Islamic university uh, at one time is quite impossible. That's what Professor Islam was saying that the process we have to go into the number of years in order to be mature uh, as a full-fledged Islam, uh, integrated Islamic university. Maybe by transforming it by uh, by offering one or two programs first and then later on, after four years, we can have a full-fledged one program. And, and we take time in it until uh, 10 years, 15 years, the university will become a full-fledged Islamic university. So that's my, my last word. Uh, thank Prof. you. Aslam, please. Right. Yeah, I am just looking at some of the you know questions in the chat. I mean, you know, bachelor of fisheries, um, engineering, I, I'm sorry, I, you know, this is beyond me, but, but I, I do believe there are some attempts being done, uh, maybe in those more uh, science-based programs, the idea is to provide the worldview and the foundations, yeah? Um, the technical aspects maybe, well, I, I, I don't want to comment, I think I leave it to people in, in those areas. Um, does a degree name matter? I mean, actually, it does. Although I do agree with the with the you know with the comment that more important is the content of the program. But you know, the name of the degree matters. If you call your degree, uh, you know, in a certain way, it may not have any demand. So if you are in a Muslim minority country and you decide to organize a program and call it Bachelor of Islamic Economics, it may not it may not be something that you know your graduates are going to get jobs in your country. So you may need to call it Bachelor of Economics, right? Uh, IIUM. This is this is the best example I can think. We were established in 1983, as mentioned by Dr. Jamil, but until today, when people do studies about Islamic economics, they don't include IIUM because our degree is called Bachelor of Economics. So I, you know, I find that so, um, so amazing because people just look at the nomenclature. They look for Islamic economics. So if you don't call your degree Islamic economics, you don't get covered and you're not represented as, um, you know, as an uh, institution that is contributing to Islamic economics. So nomenclature is also important, but I agree with you, content. Um, there is a Zul Razak, I'm assuming this is uh, Tansri Zul, who asked a question about, it looks like as if Islamic banking is, or Islamic finance is caught in the conventional framework. Um, I, I do agree. And, 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 um, and uh, unfortunately, economics get, gets caught in it. It's actually banking and finance that has caught all the attention. And, um, you know, economics gets, in a way, caught in that because it's a related discipline. It should have been economics being the mother discipline and you have a banking and finance that comes from that Islamic mm -hmm. economics. But this is where industry has, has, has really pushed its way into universities. And, uh, you know, today we have the industry, um, you know, in a different direction, maybe from what 
the pioneers of Islamic economics talked about in the late 70s yeah, uh, and even early 80s. Um, but the good thing, yeah, the good thing is in the last 15 years or so, I do believe that even industry is now questioning the initial direction of banking and finance. Um, in Malaysia, if I just give the Malaysian example, we had a certain direction of Islamic banking finance, which, and this is from the founders of Bank Islam, they wanted to create a bank that offered banking services. So to, to basically follow conventional banking, but to do it, you know, in a in a in a in a Sharia compliant way, the term that they use. Mm. But today, uh, in the last fifteen years, they are talking about going beyond profits. Yeah, we're not only looking at making money. So there is something in Malaysia which has been uh, put forward by Bank Negara Malaysia, value based intermediation. So they want Islamic banking to play a role in promoting values other than profit. I, I think that's a great thing. Um, I, I just not too sure whether it has taken root, but certainly that would be very much in line with what Islamic economics uh, and Islamic economists have been trying to argue, uh, you know, since the 70s. We may not have done very well, but inshallah, we will have an IIUM school of economics soon, uh, you know, to, to try and address that. Wallahu alam. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, again, we would like to express our sincere thanks to both speaker, Prof. Jamil and Prof. Aslam, for a very excellent presentation. And for all of us, your presentation is priceless and invaluable thing for all participants. And uh, not all questions will be answered once. Hopefully, that uh, some of these questions will be brought to another session in this afternoon, inshallah. And we do hope that uh, such online regional workshop will be conducted uh, every year, inshallah. You know, uh, we cannot uh, finish all in one, inshallah. And uh, uh, now it's uh, Thailand, uh, 11 30, Malaysia, 12 30. So uh, I would end our uh, session by Wubilai Taufik, Wahidaya. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.